everybody. Hey, thank you for coming today and welcome to our Insider Series broadcast today. We've got a great presentation for you. Um, and uh, we have Wade Thompson. Uh, and Wade is the founder and CEO of, of uh, brand growth agency, Sun and & Sons. And they advise marketing and leadership teams of high performance brands all around the globe. They position brands um, and they really bring them to a, not only a full commercial attitude, but a full really human capacity opportunity. And he's led brand and identity projects for, for the likes of Coca-Cola, Patagonia, Esty, Merrill, and FreshBooks. And the thing about Wade that you might like to know is that he is a constant student, even though he is a consummate professional, he never stops learning culture, market, strategy, you name it. He's one of the most interesting people you'll meet today. He believes the role of brand is obviously to increase business capability and capacity in ways that absolutely enrich the human uh, experience. And it's also properly that I um, share with you that once upon a time, Wade sat in those Zoom seats right where you were um, going back into history and time. And uh, that's been a quite a while. And now he's very successful, and it's um, and it's with that all in mind and that spirit that we um, we begin the programming. Wade, thanks for coming today. Hey, thanks for having me, y'all, um, and thanks for being here. I know uh, nobody wants one more Zoom meeting. It looks like uh, man, who was able to? Uh, I scrolled by somebody's, and it looked like they had a whole gang of people hanging out at home. So. Kudos to you for uh, for recruiting a, a <laughs> group of folks, um, y'all. I'm uh, again Wade Thompson. I run a firm called Sun and Sons. I've been in the brand world uh, like actively for um, I mean, probably about. Don't let me do the math. I should. Like, oh, for, for a while, right? So I've been I've been leading my own firm for 12, 13 years. Uh, worked with others for about five years before that. Um, and uh, and I was in your seat. I was a student at Portfolio Center uh, uh, before becoming uh, um, you know, mad. And I, I think for, for me, like you're in this position of this just pure potential, right? And this idea of, um, Everything can be what if, and I think it's a really beautiful place because especially right now in the business community, the world is driven by like what must be, right? Or, or what things have to be. And you're at a place right now where you get to remind us what we could imagine and what we could be, right? The businesses, even businesses that are thriving during COVID have often been dominated by fear and have shrunken uh, budgets that would go to creativity or innovation or different ways to connect with, with humans. And more it's uh, gone towards operations, right? So how do we manage business continuity? How do we make sure um, you know, we wanna keep people safe, right? And that's an important thing, right? That, that attribute of, you know, um, but sometimes it's important to be afraid, right? We want to make sure our business stays open. We want to make sure that uh, we're operating in ways that don't, uh, you know, increase the spread of, you know, and accelerate a pandemic. Uh, we want to operate in really responsible, kind ways. Great. Uh, but a lot of the budget that would have gone to, hey, how do we, how do we connect with people? How do we innovate and grow and do things that, make more meaning and grow more love for brands. That's really getting kind of put on hold for a little bit in favor of just pure operational efficiencies, right? And so now we're living in a world full of tasks, right? If we were live, I would get to hang out with you in person. We would have dinner the night before we do this. I would do a workshop with you in person, right? There's all this like downtime, right? So uh, I get to see you, understand how you're working. I get this more holistic view of you and you get a more holistic view of me as a person and as a practitioner, right? Um, and we're living in this world where we're each in our little pod uh, doing more technical task-focused work than this big broad loom 
that kind of weaves us together. Right? So um, right now, uh, imagine yourself at some party and you've just started talking to the weird, weird girl in the corner and you're like, well, why, is, uh, why is she all alone? And you start to talk to her or him and you realize, oh, because they're a total nut job and they won't stop, uh, shut up about their cats, right? I'm going to be that way about brands because I haven't had a chance to talk to people about this for a long time and I've been a little bit cooped up. So, uh, so, so let's do this. Uh, I'm a bad designer or I'm a mediocre designer, right? I'd only go so far as a pure identity designer, right? I think I kind of suck. I prefer other people's work to my work. Um, so if you have big ideas or you're better at some aspects of this practice of writing and design, um, you know, video, photography, whatever it is that you're into, um, just know that there's, there's room for all of us, right? Um, we're not all going to be the, the most, you know, like Massimo Vanelli or folks like, you know, Michael Beirut. They're, we each have a, a, a role to play and kind of bring value. And as long as we nurture that, right, uh, we're in good shape. But if, um, regardless of how much time I try to be an amazing graphic designer, I'll only be pretty good, right? Um, but there are other things that I can really ex ex excel at. So here's Sun and Sons is an extension of Portfolio Center, right? Um, or uh, MAD, right? The everything I learned in your seat is what I wanted to keep going with. I didn't want to let go of it, right? I just was not willing to say I, I want to work differently, right? Or I, I just want to work some traditional way. I love the idea of being insanely passionate. Uh, I love the idea of just working with, um, you know, super talented peers. And that's why the second I graduated from school, I went back to teach, right? Because I love working with y'all and you feed me so much and we get to learn from each other. Um, so my business and the way that I continue to work is based off of uh, this uh, deep collaboration and, and just kind of flamboyant creativity uh, we started the business I did accidentally, right? Um, because I was excited. I was, um, trying to help people out. I was super curious. I was open. I was easy to work with. And that was pretty fun. And I ended up with some really big projects, uh, from the Coca-Cola company and they were too big for me and I didn't want to work all night. I'm not that person. Um, I knew I'd do better stuff if I brought a crew with me. So that's where Sun and Sun started, right? It really started as a group of young creative people doing work that was way over our heads. And we were just killing it. We were in a small studio in, uh, in Manhattan. Uh, and, you know, we'd have clients fly to us thinking that we're some like big agency, right? Like we had some dude fly to us from New Zealand. And he was so pissed off that we just had this crummy spot, right? We were like, we we're on uh, Broadway in Houston, up on the tenth floor of this building above a methadone clinic, right? And you know, he just as like, it just it, it just shattered his whole idea of of who he thought we were. Um, he thought it was going to be like some beautiful lobby and a guest reception area and a billiard table and a bar and you know some whatever. I guess he wanted caviar stuff. But we ended up still doing the work for him and doing great. But I, I would just say that, you know, it's all about the people, the work, the passion, your heart, and what you can bring to folks. Um, and that, you know, if you want to start something up small or do something amazing that's way above your head, like it's, it's not above you. Um, you can, um, you know, connect with people uh, who believe in you and do, do amazing things that are, um, you know, uh, maybe an agency of a hundred people might be doing, and it's you and and like three or four of your friends from school. Right? So that's um, Sun and Sons is this kind of rambunctious group. I'm going to show you some pictures uh, just to uh, help focus this. And I hate to do this death by um, by PowerPoint or whatever the hell we're going to do now PDF, uh, but just. Here's an old picture of our team. Um, a lot of these people are not with the team anymore, but these are all nice, friendly people. Many of them uh, graduates from your school and uh, they're super happy. I'm sorry, I was kind of a dork, midlife crisis, guitar and skateboard. It's kind of a jump the shark move. Uh, okay, 
here's what we do. Uh, we work with a lot of these clients and really help them think about um, what is so beautiful and unique about you and how do we make sure that we codify that in ways that help you outperform your peers. Um, just quick exercise, right? Um, we're going on a little scatterbrained walk with me. If I had it my way, I'd just go on a walk around, you know, the city with each of you and talk about all this stuff. But right, we see this, like we want it. We love the package. It's a pretty, pretty picture. Uh, it makes me thirst for it. Um, maybe I want this. Maybe this is boring packaging. I don't know. This used to be important to some people. I'm not sure if it is anymore, right? This is pretty cool. I'd rather have this from my daughter or from a friend than any of the other stuff we looked at, right? But, um, but we do judge books by their cover and we have a pretty good idea of, of what's inside them, right? And we do that with people too. And, and we do that with brands. And I would say like as a species, we know that the dude who eats the funny looking fruit is the same dude that like is doubled over puking and eventually like gets left from the tribe and uh, we don't see him anymore, right? So kind of going back to caveman days, right? we are really, really, really good at seeing and perceiving and judging based on that. And sometimes it backfires on us. Um, and uh, we have all of these biases that we're not aware of, but as far as, uh, you know, the world of brands and our perception, we don't eat rotten fruit and we kind of have a good idea of like, hey, maybe we stay away from these kind of things, right? I'd love to talk to you all day about this. What's a brand, right? Um, let's work with this. Uh, products help you do things. Brands help you feel things, right? Nike ad, kid doesn't even have a pair of shoes, right? It's, it's not even a product there, right? Uh, find your greatness. Oh, well, okay, I get it, right? I feel it. I want to be there. Um, to some of our clients, I just say that it gives you permission to be radically yourself, right? And to, to be fully and wholly who you are. And I'll talk about it too, as being more you and more different. Right? And when you know who you are and you're more of you and you're more different, the speed at which you can act at is insane, right? You can really fly. Um, you don't have to have a consensus meeting or go to a committee to come up with an idea, right? When you know who you are, you're confident and, and able to do that. And it's articulated in some way so that a large enterprise knows how to respond and act based on, you know, with agility. Uh, it's insane the speed at which you can move and how close you can stay to customers and how quickly you can invent and do things that are constantly relevant because it's a reflex, right? It's not a creative brief. It's just how you are, how you behave. This is a dog's breakfast of about 14 proposals, but just to show some stuff. If you live in Atlanta, you probably know what Midtown is or you, you've, you've seen this or you've been over here. Um, we, we created a brand for Midtown a couple of years ago. So Midtown was literally like, there's a, a downtown and a Buckhead and Midtown was whatever was in the middle, right? So you don't wanna be in the middle, right? Um, it was understood as a dangerous place where there was uh, the perception of crime was greater than the actual crime. If you live north of Florida and south of Tennessee, uh, you may claim Midtown, right? And then another thing is that for Atlanta, uh, at least then, Midtown was the first kind of urban operating system. The first, you know, you can park your car or take public transportation, and then you do a hundred things by foot, right? You don't drive your you know, Lexus to the Petco and then drive it 10 feet over to the Target and 10 feet over to Smoothie King and 10 feet over to whatever uh, nail salon, right? So just a quick overview, right? So stuck in the middle, understood as dangerous, biggest Texas, and it's this urban thing. Um, so what we did is we got hyper-specific, right? So how do you make Midtown Atlanta a place where it feels like an actual place and not a bunch of just glass skyscrapers. So we show real things, like Fox Theater and uh, Music Midtown, right? Um, we fill it with this language that feels friendly, right? It's got Rockwell, this nice slab serif typeface. It feels super fun, right? Um, instead of being in the middle, 
we became the heart of it all, right? Super simple stuff, just fun identity. It's really celebratory. It's big, like turning all the lights on, super fun. And doing some really cool stuff that we actually didn't do this. Somebody liked the identity so much, they just um, they actually did this themselves, right? Um, this isn't a big enterprise. This is easy. You walk down Peachtree Street, you see people, you talk to people, and you help position the brand in such a way that it can do some pretty big things, right? It can attract more development dollars. It can attract more tenants from a commercial standpoint, businesses, retail, you know, corporate headquarters. Uh, and it can also attract more, uh, more residents, right? So all of a sudden, um, all this work, hey, it's looks neat. I showed you a couple banners. The work's really deep. It positions the entire district uh, um, uh, in, in a really positive way. So they get more of what they want. There's this place called Museum of Design, Atlanta. It had a kind of pretty outdated identity, but it also didn't have a point of view, right? Um, we learned that a lot of museums talk about being experts, right? But expertise is kind of boring. Um, museums are scary for a lot of people. There's this thing called threshold anxiety where folks are scared to go into a museum, right? There are museum folks and art kids and people like us that we like these different experiences. Uh, for a ton of people, it's like an anxiety attack walking into a museum. Designers are scariest. Uh, designers are scary, right? Uh, like we look like an Elvis impersonator. We wear all black. Uh, we have these funny glasses. Uh, we'll make fun of you if you use the wrong typeface. Like we're we're pretty, uh, you know, uh, we're like fascist uh, and totalitarian when it comes to uh, things like this. And then also there's this brand, you know, like museum of the MO is kind of useless, like museum of chicken wings, museum of banana fields, museum of art, every museum has the same thing. So um, what we did is we helped reposition Moda as um, this super fun place that's really casual. We introduced things like barbecues, right? That design shops couldn't do. We said MO became Mo, like I want Mo, can I have some Mo? Uh, milkshakes and uh, hot dogs and hamburgers. Uh, you know, for a museum, this is, you know, right? Like Vanelli's rolling over in his and her grave, right? Uh, we use four different typefaces, right? Uh, for this, right? It's like, you know, it's, it's just absurd. Like we're not supposed to do these things, right? So we're able to break a lot of these rules. Um, and it's been really helpful for the museum because uh, following all the rules just helps you fit in with everybody else. And so Moda became that we want more. We want more design Atlanta, right? So more Mo design Atlanta, right? And so, you know, we broke all the design rules in order to do this. Um, but we're able to connect with people in completely different ways than we had before, right? And invite, like, think about new types of exhibits, right? If I want more equity in my design, if I want more black women in my design, if I want more, whatever that is, it helped the Museum of Design take a deep look at all these different areas, right? So it's just super exciting. Legos, right? I mean, Legos are the antithesis of design, right? We're about, you know, this auth you know, authorship and control. Anybody can do Legos, right? So here we are inviting people who are wearing t-shirts and shorts, uh, like cargo shorts and Tevas and stuff like that into our, our realm of like, you know, you're supposed to have like all black uh, t-shirt and pants and a pair of, you know, crisp Stan Smiths, right? Or some Jordans, like we have really, you know, designers are supposed to look a certain way, right? We're inviting um, folks in flip-flops to participate in this and really think about design. So it's super cool. Um, Etsy, you know, bigger company, we got to work with the CEO and the whole leadership team to position the brand and the business uh, for uh, consumers, for uh, internal audiences, for stakeholders got to do values and a lot of big corporate strategy. But, you know, the original perception was this is where you go if you live in Portland and you knit funny little things or you do, you know, felt knitting and needlepoint, right? Or if you're my grandmother, cat lady. Um, so it was only seen as like the starter kit uh, and for curiosities, right? And so we actually worked with them 
to uh, completely reposition the brand. So it became a really powerful uh, e-commerce uh, site that helped its sellers and, and makers and, and buyers um, shop in totally different ways, right? So um, just through a lot of series of, of workshops and collaborations, but right, you know, it's helping a, a company wrap its head around who it is, right? So for Etsy, liberating individual expression from the tyranny of the herd, there's like a bunch of stuff that goes behind this that is proprietary and I don't think I should share it, but like um, it's a simple belief that we are better as human beings and our life is so beautiful, not because we're the same, but because of our unique differences, right? And so when you build a brand based on that, rather than a brand based on a transaction, like everything changes, right? Um, and it enables new products and new services and new ways of marketing and new ways of promotion and new content to be generated. So helping an entire enterprise get grounded in something that's deeply human, um, that's powerful. Or um, we get to help Patagonia uh, think through strategy, really simplify it and focus it, kind of articulate it in a new way. Um, and then also simplify you know, their brand identity. So they had more logos than there are states in the United States. Um, if you wanted to approve something, you had to go ask the founder. Um, and uh, we had to give some structure for who they were, like the radical, the wild, and the free. This is the first ever visual identity system that I've been able to create that has as part of the system, a protest poster, right? So it's like a corporate protest poster um, as part of this. Yeah. Um, and so we were able to write this narrative for them uh, to really help codify the, the brand. This is for like retail employees, right? Like, hey, I've start here. What's a brand? Um, what's our brand? What's all this stuff about, right? So, you know, what? we're deliberately and strategically and passionately anti-conventional. We know the road to hell is paved with planned obsolescence, mass marketing, fashion weeks, and corporate greenwashing. And so it's a brand that really gets to call out the BS that's going on in the world. Um, but at the same time, we needed like really, really rigid, rigorous uh, standards for this brand as it's growing throughout the world. So if you're opening up the new shop in Kyoto, you don't need to go back to Ventura, California to get your 27 questions answered to just produce the sign for the front of your store, right? Um, so had to create a brand identity that can do all this kind of stuff from, from social to online, e-commerce, to publishing, uh, and show up in all the different ways that we need brands to show up so that they can build this stuff with speed and scale. Complete non sequitur. Um, you know, so if, if you're building a brand right now, um, you got a couple things that, that you, you have access to, right? You have the access, access to the internet. And let's say we're making an insurance brand. These are a bunch of insurance companies, right? And a lot of these are more digital focused uh, uh, insurance companies or new kind of digital emerging uh, technology firms that somehow make our life a little bit easier. So we can start to look at this and say, well, right. Hmm, what kind of type do they use? What, you know, what do they look like? How do they behave? What do they say, right? You can look at the colors. Cool. All right. Well, I think blue is probably out if we're going to start our new insurance company. Maybe we think about a few different colors. Right? And then we get to look at some of the stuff, right? Oh, how are they talking? What are they saying? Um, right? So I love looking at, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Oscar. We had nothing to do with this. Um, but I think it was really great. Like they had these funny little doodles when they first started, you know, the doctor will see you now. Um, but just, you know, sharing all these kind of awkward little moments about, you know, geez, I, I wish I had another way to, to see with my, you know, to, to, to share information with my doctor um, faster, easier, and more confidential. Um, but, you know, we can quickly see where every other company is, right? And understand, hey, how can we be different? Boom. So here's the, um, I don't know if this is like a weird stuff or, but you know, if you want to know a strategy for aligning a blockbuster movie with a carbonated beverage and a kid's cereal and a value meal at Burger King, like I'm not your person for that strategy, right? Um, 
if you want to figure out like how come no one wants to come back to work after COVID? Uh, how come we can't recruit the best talent? How come people are leaving us? Um, how come we're getting more downward pressure on our prices or there's less love for our brand or people are not willing to pay a premium? Um, how come our culture feels flat and ineffective? Then like ding, 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 like let, let, me, let me join you. I'm good for that. Um, and so here's what we dig into, right? So I'm talking from like hypothetical brands and like, here's how we build this stuff, okay? Um, and I'm giving you kind of the Wade Thompson starter pack. So like, if we talk again later, you can figure out like which of these 20 things you wanna talk about, um, you know? So if some of you might like something, some of you don't. So hopefully there's like a smorgasbord, you can take what you like and um, happy to, to follow up with you or talk with you about this stuff. Uh, but we call this our truth mandala. Um, it was like a, kind of a square egg. Yeah, it's like that. Um, but basically, is this your brand, right? This little yellow thing or whatever, the space that you operate in. There are four areas that if you're thinking about building brands, even in school, like, okay, what should I be thinking about? So you want to understand the enterprise, like whatever company you're working for, how do you understand that thing, right? So uh, if it's a, all right, like, let's say it's a, um, uh, you know, a bottled water, okay, like, well, how do they show up? Where do they show up? Are they refrigerated or are they at ambient temperature? Are they sold individually or are they sold in like 36 packs? Are they sold via subscription, right? So how do you understand the business? How is it capitalized? Is it actually making money or is it just selling for low in a startup phase? Who are the investors? Uh, who are the board members? What kind of strengths do they have? Like what, what regions are they operating in? You really want to understand every single thing you can about a business. What are the stories it tells, right? What are its big hero moments, right? Um, and then it's great to understand humankind, right? Because humans are thirsty people and you've got this water brand that you're going to sell. So um, let's understand people and what's going on with them and in really, really, really deep ways. You know, I think one of the things that um, we benefited from and some work we got to do with Sonos was. Sonos just gave their speakers to like, I don't know, like maybe, maybe they kitted out like 100 to 500 houses, like homes from, you know, folks living in, you know, like Kuala Lumpur or New York, or San Francisco, Atlanta, Topeka, wherever, right? And said so like, hey, you take this questionnaire every so often, right? And they found out that, you know what, when you have music in your house, um, you feel happier you do more activities together, like dishes aren't so bad. Uh, they found out that home households where couples listen to music, they were more romantic, right? Um, all sorts of things were, were happening. They would have more impromptu dance parties, all sorts of fun stuff, right? So that, that, you know, that looking at how are humans, like what's going on in the lives of humans and how are they um, uh, responding to, you know, or how, as, as it relates to, to whatever your, your business is, your brand, right? Really understanding people, right? So again, uh, for water, cool. Um, you know, what are the moments we drink water? How do we feel about uh, things like, uh, you know, a huge stack of plastic bottles by the waste bin? Do we feel guilty about these things? Um, do we feel, uh, you know, talking to individuals, do we have a preference for it? tap water, for filtered water, for bottled water, whatever that is. Like, but we want to go talk to people and find out and watch them to like, what are they doing? When do they buy it? How do they buy it? Um, do they feel guilty about it? Whatever. And then culture, right? So, so many big culture moments. For culture, I'd say that this is like technology, this is science, this is politics, right? So, you know, one of the biggest cultural moments that you're, you're going to school and you're enrolled in school, but you're not totally in school or I'm at work, but I'm not actually at work. Um, we're learning so much with COVID and the way that we are living our lives, the time, the, the where we spend time, how we spend time. All these things are super, super big. Um, maybe uh, because I can look at uh, 10,000 TikTok videos in two minutes, all of a sudden I'm hyper aware that uh that like I'm overweight, I'm not cool, I'm not funny, and I'm gonna do all these, you know, 
exercise classes and weight loss classes and learn how to be a better social human being or whatever it is, right? But like what effect does social media or whatever emerging technologies, what, what does that have on us? Um, what does it mean if I don't have to drive anymore or be in traffic because I'm not commuting anymore? Like all these things would influence, right? If I'm a water brand, um, when and how I can sell water. Because if I only sell water uh, outside at the, or at the gas station or convenience station, and I'm no longer driving to the convenience station, we need to think of new ways to sell water, right? And then in terms of the marketplace, like who else is there? What are your, uh, who are your competitors? How are they showing up to market? Um, what are their price points? What are their propositions? How are they offering this? Um, but I think there's so many different things to get curious about and you can pose your own questions, but these are four huge jumping off points um, that can help you think about how your brand needs to operate in the world, okay? There's the flower. Um, this is a fun tr trick. Um, if you're waiting on someone at the bar and you have a pen and a napkin, um, just to draw these two lines is two continuums, uh, one from me to we, one from explore to control. So um, me, uh, right now I'm just talking about myself um, and, uh, but there are times in our lives where we want to be known as different from other people, right? I want to be the one who ran faster or I want to be the one who, who won this project or did this slam dunk or whatever it is that I did, right? Like I wanted to find myself as an individual against the group, right? There are other times where I wanna be part of our community. I wanna be part of this community that we're in together as, as students of design. When the Hawks are doing great, I wanna be part of that community too, right? Uh, when Atlanta's doing cool stuff, I wanna be part of that. I wanna identify as an Atlantan, however that goes, right? Um, then in terms of this other, um, continuum. I want to think about how we exist in the world, uh, whether we want to control our environment or whether we want to go explore. So think, go back to caveman days. Um, we're sitting in a cave. Uh, it's a little damp. It's kind of chilly, smells funny. Um, but at least, you know, there's nothing else with sharp teeth in that cave, right? So that we can hang out in here and be safe. Or we hear the beat of uh, some cave people drums uh, a few mountains away, right? And all of a sudden we think maybe we wanna go explore what's going on over there. Is that a party? Uh, are they having like a cave rave or are they like about to um, you know, do some cannibalism stuff? Not really sure, but I'm open for it. I wanna go explore, right? This is, you know, I'm gonna stay at home and watch, uh, you know, just stream some shows or I'm gonna go out to the club or out to the party or out to dinner with friends and go for something new, right? And all through the day, we have these experiences. Like sometimes we want something familiar, sometimes we want something new, but like from a brand world, it helps us get these different realms that we can tap into, right? So um, this realm of mastery and it's about me and controlling my environment, right? Um, maybe this is like one of those stock trading companies like uh, that positions itself uh, I think it's called like Scott trade. Like, so let's say, let's take that for example, like 99% of the uh, like, you know, day, like you go be your own day trader and, and do a bunch of stock tricks, right? It's in this idea of you control your own destiny, right? But perhaps um, somebody like Robin Hood could position themselves in this realm of participation. It's like, no, it's actually about exploring new financial opportunities and we're doing this like we together as a community um, and you can go like together, we can figure this out. Uh, and it's, you know, we're, we're, we're breaking new boundaries and, and inviting you to this place that you didn't have ability to participate in before, right? Um, you get Nike in here, it's like realm of journey, right? It's about me and exploring. Marlboro man's like somewhere way off the page over here on the me side, like riding a horse in the sunset. In this realm of authenticity about like caring and control, brands like Johnson and Johnson, brands like Volvo, right? So you can chop up these different kind of core emotional uh, attributes. So as you're thinking about branding or building something, like that's a cool way to do it. It's just, um, is it about a, me as an individual? Am I going to be a brand that's about we together? 
or a brand about exploring something or controlling something. Think about it with car brands. Right? So, um, you know, BMW, the ultimate driving machine, right? It's like master the road, right? Um, all sorts of different propositions you can break down. Let's zip around a little bit here. What's really fun with brands, uh, I just want to share a, a few kind of uh, less, probably lesser known brands, right? Um, Sarah has a two salons. She has a salon that has no mirrors, right? Um, so I think what's really cool with brands is when you understand what is essential to you, you can then reject category norms, right? So the norm is any salon you go to, you sit in front of a mirror, you look at yourself with your hair wet down, comb straight over the face, you look like a wet rat, right? And you stare at yourself in a smock with your hair looking as horrible as it's ever looked for an hour or whatever. And then at the very end, you don't feel like a wet rat and you look pretty, right? So her entire salons, um, no mirrors, right? You look at it later, right? But you're just talking to her, right? And um, uh, having an awesome friendly haircut, right? So the psychic hair hotline, right? Um, all this super fun stuff, right? but it's a small business, but there are two of them and it's really successful and it means a lot to people. People love this place. Um, this is a fun group. This is a fellow, uh, this is a PC grad um, who, who put this together. Uh, it's called Malvin. Um, so it's like golf without granddad, right? So what if we had a golf brand that's like, all the skate brands, right? So does golf have to be stuffy? Does golf have to be boring? Um, does, you know, golf have to look like you're the world's most boring lawyer? Uh, no, right? Super successful brand, um, really fun. This dude has an iron company. He loves making stuff out of iron and um, he's just this crazy dude who wears a kilt all the time, right? But uh, um, I guess if you're only one person, you kind of get to do whatever you want to. Um, but, you know, I think if you extrapolate this, right? So what if you built a whole brand off of someone who just wears hockey, uh, hockey jerseys and like uh, kilts? Um, then you get a pretty cool brand for, for an iron worker, right? But everybody knows this dude. His trucks are like rolling thunder. Um, and uh, there he goes. He looks like a, like a, a maniac. But He's rejected like what he's supposed to look like, what he's supposed to wear. Um, you know, he's supposed to be wearing a pair of like what, you know, Dickies overalls and, and welder's gloves and a pair of um, Timberland boots or, you know, Red Wing boots, right? But he's not really doing that. Um, so let me, I wanted to take a little bit of time. Um, beep, stop the chair. Uh, so apologize for all the all the picture sharing, but I, I want to give some examples and point to a couple things um, so you get an idea of, of some of this stuff. But I guess what what I'd love for you to think about what it, like what do brands do and what are their roles? And so I think at an enterprise level, which is probably where a lot of you will be working and thinking about brands. Um, you have a lot of different layers of brands, but at some of the highest layers, I think brands can give permission to companies to be amazing and do really bold things. And I don't mean this in like a, a Hallmark Channel way. I mean that um, it, the, when you're developing a brand, there's this like permission that you get, right? It's like bringing a child into the world, right? And we say, what do we want for this child, right? And it's not, you know, we want what everybody else has. It's like, no, 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 we, we want this thing to be this like beautiful thriving creature that flourishes, that grows, that's confident, that can go out in the world and do all sorts of amazing things. Like that's what we want. And you get that same permission when you're launching a brand, right? You're creating that brand. So you get to bake into it a lot of the characteristics that you love. And the way I think about it, uh, again, getting into the weird stuff is like, how do you define um, 
So it's like, I don't know, like what is, maybe it's like a pantheon of gods, right? Like what are the gods that you want to, you know, or what are the attributes? What are the positive human attributes that we want to bake into this? Do we want to be, you know, the super kind, caring brand, um, uh, you know, and what's really cool about this is once you agree to this as a brand, we're going to do this, right? So with, with Etsy, like um, we're going to be all for this group of people and we are going to be all about celebrating these differences. Well, then all of a sudden you get to say, well, how does that being played out in our, uh, our diversity and in, in hiring? Uh, are we celebrating differences or are we different, right? Oops. So what, what you're doing, I mean, a brand can be in some ways a trap, right? Where you say, hey, aren't these all good things? Don't we all agree to them? Yes, these are great. Okay, now that we've agreed to them, how do you bend the entire organization in order to deliver these things, right? We said we believe these, how do we start to enforce these? And not in ways that are like pure discipline and, and, and like a penal way, but ways that really invite everybody in the company to believe in the company and to do something big, right? So it's it goes way beyond marketing. Uh, at least you know for me, maybe yeah, brand can can help uh, if if we do it right long term, a brand can build um, kind of guaranteed future sales and it can build in higher margins, which means uh, I'm willing to pay a premium for uh, you know this pink marker over this pink marker because this is a special brand, right? So I'm willing to pay more for this and I'm more likely to continue to buy it. So the future viability of my company uh, kind of rests in this brand. Um, so, you know, as, as we do this, I, I just, you know, I would say like be human, like be human as hell. Like just think about um, what are the sacred things that, that make you real, that make you love your friends? Um, and how do you get so real in a brand um, and avoid, you know, it's so easy to get in this world of corporate BS, but, uh, you know, how do you create a brand for a world that is, you know, broken or hurting or completely uh, transforming in front of us, right? Um, you know, how do you create a brand that's some cosmic dialysis for whatever the stuff is that we're all going through? Uh, there's a real, ability, I think, um, to do this in ways that help companies matter. Because if, if companies don't do this, they start to become commodities, right? So why would I work at company A versus company B, right? What, what do they stand for? What do they believe in? Why would I buy company A's product over company B? I mean, the truth is, I don't know that the Patagonia shorts are better than the Columbia shorts or that they're better than whatever brand Target just came up with to sell me cheap athletic shorts. But I believe in the Patagonia brand. I believe in what they're doing. And I'm gonna end up doing those, right? Not just from a badge purchase because people see me wear a product that I think is, is cool and that they'll like me for that, but from a kind of a deep motivation, right? So with all the brands that we're doing, like how do we create brands that, that help young talent like you want to work there? Uh, to recruit the best talent from around the country, around the world. Um, like this is what we're doing with a brand is we're creating a soul of a workplace and a workforce and a business. And once that soul permeates through the entire culture, the business moves so much faster, right? So if everybody is like, gets it, right? Is, has this Eureka experience and knows this is what my company is about, this is what I'm doing. I know how to innovate. I know how to create you know, new products. I know how to optimize customer service because no more is customer service about being the most efficient, right? We're spending the least possible. Customer service becomes about how you create some maniac fan, right? Who loves us so much or um, whatever it is, right? But it's to be, what are we gonna be hell bent on to, uh, to do totally different? So um, I'd love to, uh, to take some, I've got a, 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 a hard stop uh, just right before five. I just probably need just like a minute to hop on my next thing, but I, I'd love to uh, to hear some thoughts or talk with y'all a little bit. 
Um, yeah, wait. Um, actually, I have a question. Um, how do you see the brands moving forward since COVID started uh, happening? And how you see all these corporate uh, BS uh, like moving away of the branding actually or the, the, the marketing department of brands or you see they are moving to a more real uh, open uh, world? I don't know. I hope we get, I hope the COVID experience has taught us that we need each other as a species. Like we're, we, we like other humans and we need each other and that we're so interconnected, right? So I hope we learn from that in long term. We go for these like more robust, vibrant brands. I think right now, um, what we're seeing is things more product focused or transaction focused rather than, uh, you know, uh, it's this big experience, right? We're, we're, we're timid about ushering in a big new idea in a time when we don't feel any great certainty, right? There's some, uh, you know, financial uncertainty, some health uncertainty, overall economic certainty, still some like, you know, clouds of political uncertainty. But in terms of brands, like what do we see? Um, look at, uh, I would just say some agencies and companies are subverting some of the core aspects that maybe brands had assumed. And so one idea was, longevity or permanence, right? Hey, we're building this forever. This is going to be around for decades. And so um, we'll have to see if this is going uh, to be successful or if it's uh, a misstep. But you see certain um, brands in the tech world or product world go to places that feel very right now. So it's more of brand as promotion instead of brand as soul or brand as uh, like this long-term essence, right? So um a rebranding is almost just like an advertising campaign. Um, and you could question some of the durability of some, some pop brands that, that you may see in the marketplace. So I think one of the things that we're seeing and that agencies are testing, and I think it's bright and we need to, I don't know how it's gonna work out, is do brands need to be forever? Do brands need to be consistent? You know, Go through your textbook from whatever gorp I just told you or whatever you read and say, well, what if that's not true? What if brands don't have to be forever? What if brands don't have to be consistent? Uh, what if brands can be super fluid? Uh, you know, and so just testing those. But, but right now, uh, I hope we get back there, but I think that uh, a, a lot of industries have, have reduced that kind of spending and thinking. They're getting back to it very much so right now. But um, I think we've had about a year and a half of, of uh, suffocation. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I have a, I guess I have a question that kind of piggybacks on, on it. Um, you know, from my understanding, a brand should strive to be authentic because when you're authentic, you know, then that way the consumer can kind of connect with you and, and have some sort of understanding and there's trust. Um, what else should a, a brand aspire to be other than authentic? Yeah, yeah, I think that's, I think that's, that's right. Um, I, I think, and, and by authenticity, like we can mean a few things, right? Um, and part of that is the courage, right? It's not just what we do as marketeers, but there's so many levels. Will we launch this product? Will we invest R&D towards this, right? So I would look at it in terms of like fidelity, right? Like, so, or, or continuity, are all the parts of the business operating like this, right? Or does the marketing product, is the marketing department just say one thing and then, you know, the supply chain is still not diversifying or, uh, or moving towards, you know, more sustainable partnerships, whatever it is. Uh, the business has to move collectively uh, towards this. So that's, by the authenticity, it's not just saying authentic things, it's making sure that actions and, and words align. Um, so I think there's a radical coordination across the entire enterprise is really important. And then I think too that, hey, just being able to say, like, I don't know, let's go back to our water brand. Let's say, hey, I got this cool water brand, um, but guys, I'm really sorry because this packaging sucks and I'm really dissatisfied with it. I want to get to a place where we have this super breakthrough sustainable packaging, but I'm not there yet, right? I think honesty, uh, and just being able to be vulnerable is, is going to be a, a good part of it. But um, yeah, anyway, I think, yeah, just, it, just I guess you're right. 
added more context to how you're right and how it's important. But yeah, good, good point, good question. I would do one more question. If you... um, I guess I have a question. Have yeah. you ever had to work on a brand that you didn't believe in? Or do you think that like any brand can be like salvaged? Mm. So some of my projects that I love the most are, you know, like, let's be honest, if you work with Nike, you have a pretty good idea of what your project's going to look like at the end of it, right? It's probably mm -hmm. got to have, uh, you know, like, right, Futura Bold Condensed, right? And one of eight uh, approved photographs, things like that. And so I think some of the most enriching projects for us are those where you help a client have that Eureka experience and where you can really help them travel, right? So it's cool to put up a logo of, hey, we all heard of these brands, it's great, great. I got to work there. It's like a, a certificate or a diploma, right? A seal of approval. Like, well, how, how much did I move them or, right? I don't know. I mean, I, I really hope we contributed in meaningful ways. And some of our work does so more than others, but if it's from a pure visual standpoint, how do you, get, how do, you do it? Um, so let me say um, this. I believe that people who are a lot different from me or think differently from me still have some, you know, like I think that the people who stormed the Capitol have some values and some feelings that are, that are need to be honored in some way or that they have some motivation that is, you know, ex expressed in some horrible, egregious way. But like, I think that, like, I really believe that I can sit down and talk with anyone and get to some eternal truths, right? And that's what my work has shown me that, uh, and one of the reasons we've been successful is that we've been able to take teams that, you know, maybe five agencies were hired before us, but they couldn't take it to the finish line because they, they couldn't get everybody there, right? And so one of the things that we do is I think there's something remarkable about any organization, any organization that exists or has uh, been around for a while or, or is at this point and says, we wanna make a big change, right? So typically these would be mid cap organizations that are looking to make a uh, um, big strategic uh, shift so that they can capture growth. Uh, yeah, what is that? How can we help them find what's remarkable in their organization and focus on that and, 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 and help them accelerate. Uh, so even with, with things that, like, oh gosh, this, this is gonna be so tough. They don't, these aren't design people, they're engineering people, they're different, they don't get it. You know, it's not about that. It's, it's about, they're the ones that you can help have this Eureka. And I promise if, a, if there's something there when someone started that company, when they founded it, there's some glint of hope there because it's hard for companies to stay in business. And if it has been staying in business, how do you find that, get real about those values or what are the, the cultural characteristics that allowed it to live and thrive? Um, and we can do it as, um, uh, man, Hey, y'all, I would love to, to keep talking with y'all. And, uh, I've, uh, I've got a, a, a big presentation, um, that starts uh, about a couple seconds ago. Um, and I know that you're going to be joined and talk a little bit about AIGA Atlanta and the student group. Um, I, I'm, I think Anna's going to talk about that. And I, uh, I think AIGA is just a great place, especially as a student, to have access to um, not that like we're people that are hard to get to, but uh, just from time wise and scheduling uh, you get to go peek in and be with people that just know you have a lot of professional folks who are out there in the world doing things who want to spend time with you and, and hear what you're doing and meet you and need people like you to, uh, to help them, you know, push their business forward. So, uh, you know, I think AIGA is something that's really fun to get involved in, not just at the Atlanta level, but it's so easy to tap into the national level. Um, Anyway, so I'm glad y'all are having that, but y'all thanks so much for, um, for, for letting me ramble. And it's just so good to see y'all's faces and, and talk. Uh, happy to, to, Hank, if you wanna share kind of email or whatever, happy to follow up with any of y'all, if there are any groups or classes that are curious about more of this stuff, um, more than willing to, to dive in and more depth, but just wanna um, say thanks and um, I really appreciate it. Thanks, Wade, for stopping by. Right. We appreciate it. Thanks y'all.